Um, so, hey, glad uh, to be with you. I thought Adam was going to sing when he took the, the microphone from... Uh, I mean, I just thought he was stepping in Jordan's role. There you go. Um, hey, uh, imagine with me, if you will. Um, so think about this scenario. Um, a family with both parents that have demanding careers, very busy family with busy schedules. Sometimes those schedules are even involved in the kids' activities that they have going on. This family loves their children deeply. They want the absolute best for them, but amidst hectic and chaotic lives, they sometimes find it challenging to devote the time, the energy, the effort, and the resources to their kids. Instead of engaging in meaningful conversations, they're usually distracted by maybe text messages and phone calls and social media and those types of things. I don't know if you know this, but the average amount of time spent per week with families in America, parents talking and having meaningful conversations with their kids, the average amount of meaningful conversation is three and a half minutes per week. That's 30 seconds a day that parents are having meaningful conversations with their kids. As the days go by, the children begin to notice a lack of quality time spent with their parents. They begin to feel a sense of emptiness and long for some more connection and involvement from mom and dad. They feel like they never get their parents' best, if you will. So they may begin to act out or withdraw. They start to seek attention in various ways. They yearn for some undivided focus from mom and dad. And over time, this family, their children's emotional well-being begins to be effective, affected, as you can imagine. It leads to lower self-esteem and difficulty expressing their feelings. They struggle to develop a sense of security, trust in relationships. They're unsure if their parents have availability and even commitment to them. Though the parents love their children deeply, the unintended consequence of giving their best effort and energy towards their kids and instead giving that to other avenues of their life results in a sense of disconnect within the family. The story may seem all too familiar. And even though that's not a real scenario of anyone I've spoke with, we know this is a real scenario that plays out in and amongst our lives every single day. That illustration, though, also plays into our own relationship with the Lord as well. If you can imagine the busy, chaotic lifestyle that we live. Did you know that amidst our crazy and chaotic lifestyle, we tend not to give God our best? We give him some leftovers. We give him What we have left over at the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month in various ways. And whether we want to admit it or not, it ultimately impacts our relationship with him. If you're new with us today, we were walking through a series that we're calling The Blessed Life. And we're talking about how we have to realize the blessed life that God has given us. In the midst of a world where we don't feel like we're blessed... Sometimes we need to step back and realize how blessed we actually are as followers of Jesus. And because of that, when we realize that we're blessed, we want to give back more. We want to give our time, our talents, our treasures, our resources, our thoughts, and so much more back. And we want to be generous in that area. What we've said from the very beginning is that the blessed life really is a generous life in many ways. And the generosity becomes, it comes from the fact that we realize how blessed we actually are. Are. Today, we're going to be talking about how the blessed life is the best life. Like when we really realize the blessed life that we have, that literally is the best life that we should be able to imagine. And here's what I want you to know as your truth for today. Like if you walk out of here knowing anything, I want you to know this. You need to give God your best, not the rest. You, you need to, in every facet and avenue of your life, give God the best and not the rest, not the leftovers, not second best, not whatever you have left over at the end of the day or after everything else is gone, but your firsts. The Bible says it very specifically. It talks about the first fruits, and we'll talk about that extensively today. 
But we're talking about the firsts in our life and our time and our talents and our treasures and our decisions and more. We should be giving God the best of everything that we have. And so I'm going to walk through a little bit differently today. Normally I stick in one passage and kind of break that down. But I think there's three passages that we can look at today that, that show the blessing of giving our best in certain avenues. And God's very specific in it. When we do give our best in these areas, in these passages, there's a blessing that comes alongside of it. Now, it's not the, the blessing, your best life now type of mentality. We've talked about that over the course of time. This isn't the prosperity piece, but it's the realizing the presence of God in our life. Last night's sunset was gorgeous. Clouds over the mountains. It was beautiful. It was another beautiful sunset in Colorado. And oftentimes, that's the blessing that we can have, remembering that the maker who made us in his image crafted and created that sunset last night. That was a blessing that we had. So blessing doesn't mean what the world means. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. So we need to learn how we can give God the best, not the rest. Let me pray, and then we're going to dive into three areas, three scriptures I think we can give God the best in and that we see a blessing in return. Father, we love you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that... You don't give us just the rest, but you give us your best. And so we'll talk about, Lord, even in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you gave us your best for us, in spite of us, God. Lord, and that at the end of the day, we live chaotic, hectic, busy lives that sometimes, if we're being really honest and transparent this morning, we give you our second best. We give you what's left over at the end of a day. We give you what's left over, maybe even at the end of the week. Lord, we give you what's left over in certain areas, God, but you don't want our leftovers, Lord. You want and desire our best, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you would encourage us through your word this morning. Do a work that only you can. We love you. We praise you, and it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. You see, when we look at this, when we see in Scripture, when we do give our best to God, there's blessings that come alongside of it, very clear in Scripture. And the three blessings I want to focus on today um, are straight from three different passages. And the first blessing is this. It's the blessing of the best produce. I know there's a lot of farmers in the room, and so this is very clear to all of you all, and I know I look like a farmer, um, but you got to get back into the times that we're reading here, right? When we pick up the Bible, we have to think about reading in context of the Bible, and so you can translate it into what our produce would be today, but when we look at this, there's a blessing of the best produce, and here's what I mean by that. The blessing with giving God our best lies in honoring Him with what we call our first fruits, and it's very clear in scripture with our first fruits. And so we honor him with our first fruits. What we're doing is we're showing him an understanding that when we give the best of our produce, we understand that all of the produce came from him. Like it's not just we're giving him what belongs to him and then we're done and the rest is ours. When we give the best of our produce, we're recognizing and realizing that all of it is his anyway. So we might as well give our best or our first fruits to him. Turn with me, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 3. It'll be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can also scan the QR code. It'll go directly to a link that says scripture reading that'll go to Proverbs 3 as well. But Proverbs 3, uh, Proverbs is written by a man named Solomon, wisest man in all the land um, that it came through. And it's a, a series of Proverbs. Wisdom literature is what it's referred to as. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, it says this, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then look at the promise that comes with it. Then, not if, not maybe, but then, after you've done this, then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. There's a command and then a consequence with following that command is what God gives us through Solomon. You see, to honor here means to give like proper weight to the possessions, or in this particular verse, the original language of the possessions actually means wealth, the wealth of produce, the wealth of your harvest. Because back in these days, it wasn't just money exchanging, but your, your uh, kind of like cash flow was based on your harvest in this way. So it was the wealth there. And it's giving a proper weight to the wealth for righteous and equitable use is basically what God is saying. So give the first or the best of your produce so that it can be used equitably in the way that it was created to. To do that, the writer starts with bringing what's called the first fruits to God. It says, bring 
the first fruits in many different scriptures, in many different verses throughout the scriptures. You notice that when it says first fruits and bringing your first fruits, it never actually says give your first fruits. It will always say bring your first fruits. You want to know why? Because you cannot give what you do not own, but you're bringing what is someone else's. So when you see in the scriptures where it says, bring your first fruits, it's meaning, hey, all of this is the Lord's. I'm only requiring you to bring the first fruits here. You cannot give what is not yours. And when we give the first fruits, we acknowledge that it's all God's. By the way, this is not just with possessions or wealth. This is with you as the worshiper. This is with you. Like offer your complete self to the Lord recognizing that you as a whole belong to the Lord. You are crafted and created in his image. He made and formed you, knew you when you were in your mother's womb, formed you in your mother's womb. The Lord says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest and your barns will be filled. Your vats will be overflowing. What that doesn't mean is that you're going to get back and get wealthy, right? This is not a get rich quick scheme. Um, This is this is your barns and your vats being filled means that you'll recognize and realize the presence of God in your life. Like when you recognize as the whole worshiper that you can give yourself to God in that way, God's promise is that His presence is with you, and His presence is better than anything else that can be promised or guaranteed for you. Like what he's saying here is that your bar, you will become so overfilled and overjoyed with his presence that your barns will be filled and your vats will be overflowing. Think of, um, think of a farmer that goes out. And this is hard because it's like weird for us. We don't live in this way because we have our rights and what we've worked for and what we've done. This is the American dream, right? I've worked hard to get where I am today. But think of a farmer in this context and he's going out and grabbing the best produce, right? I mean, maybe watermelons. I I don't know. I was like trying to think of like harvesting this week. I was like, what? I mean, we're close to Nebraska. Maybe it's corn. Maybe it's like the best shucked corn that's out there, right? If you don't know what shucking corn is, get in my boat because I've heard it, but I've never shucked corn myself. So I've actually shucked corn. Um, But maybe it's like the best corn that's out there, right? And so this, this harvester is walking out into his field and he's not going, okay, uh, let me get a little bit over here. That one looks a little shady. Probably wouldn't want to use it. I'll throw it in and give it to the Lord and bring it to the storehouse. He is walking the fields, looking for the best of the produce to bring back into the storehouse that is God's. The best to be gathered back and given to him. And when this farmer is doing this, he's realizing that, man, I'm doing this because that whole field is the Lord's. I wouldn't have any of it if it was not for him. And so he's saying, I can rightfully give back what is his, and then I will remember what he's done for me in and through my life. We'll talk about this in a minute, but God doesn't deserve our leftovers, even when it comes to things like finances and giving, right? Sometimes uh, for those of us, we talked about tithing last week. And when we tithe, sometimes it's the last thing on our mind. Oh yeah. Oh man, I meant to tithe, right? Uh, I I meant to give back to God. Well, even in this, it's going, hey, I've got to do this first and then realizing that all the rest of it is the Lord's. But it's not just with tithing. Like he doesn't deserve for us to pay our bills and then give to him, but he also doesn't deserve for us to like make our schedules and then see where we can fit him in on the side. How many of us have made like schedules for vacations that are down to the T of what we're going to do. And we have no spot in there to spend time with the Lord. We know every single minute of every single day and all the movies that we're going to watch and all the things that we're going to do. And we have not first given back to God that says, hey, I'm going to block this time to spend it with you because you deserve my best, not the rest. This means taking our provisions, taking our time, taking our talent, taking our treasures, taking our resources, taking our decisions, taking our thoughts, and first giving them all to God. You you ever um, roll out of bed? I was going to lay down here and act like I was in bed, right? But like, that's weird. Um, And so you can just imagine me laying down. And what typically, if I I were to be like 100% honest and transparent, I would say that most of the room, one of the first things they do when they roll out of the bed any morning is they do this. They begin to look at the text messages that they've received. 
Maybe you miss phone calls that they've had. Maybe it's social media and you sit there and scroll for a minute to make sure that nothing happened in the world around you while you were asleep last night. That's not giving our best and our first to God in that type of way. Like what God wants us to do is have this face down somewhere and he really wants us to just get over and just be on our knees and thanking him for another day. He wants us to thank him for the breath that woke us up that morning. That's giving our first to him. That's our best produce to him, if you will. How often do you schedule your vacation and your work week to the minute without knowing exactly when you're going to spend time with God? Give him your best, not your rest. And he promises the blessing after that. Your barns will be filled, your vats will be overflowing. But it's not only just our best produce that we have that's all his anyways. There's also this blessing of the best offering to God. The, best, uh, the blessing of the best offering is found in like wholehearted and genuine devotion and worship to God in our lives. If you're here and you're familiar with the Bible, you probably know the story of Cain and Abel. And I'm not talking about the murder that happens there, but before we even get there, when they present an offering to God, Cain's half-hearted offering was not something that the Lord was pleased with, but Abel's genuine wholehearted devotion to him was. Now, these are the, the kids of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, you have the fall. These are the children of Adam and Eve. Um, they walk through Cain, it says, work the ground, right? So he was a harvester. He was a farmer, hard worker in that type of way. And Abel was a shepherd of flocks, the scripture says. And, and in Genesis chapter four, verses three through five, this is what it says about what they bring back to God to give to him in an offering to him. Now, keep in mind, this is the first Offering. This is the first offering that we see in Scripture in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. It says this. It says, in the course of time, so at the right time, Cain prepared, presented some of the land's produce. Do me a favor, say the word some. some. Some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portion. Say the word firstborn. firstborn. There's a difference between just some produce and the firstborn of the flock. It says in verse four, the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious and he looked despondent. Cain clearly lacked sincerity in his offering. Basically, if you will, he lacked thought in his offering and he just gave him kind of whatever, right? And to be honest, in this timing of it, it's like he just gave God whatever, whenever he wanted to. That was it. I'm just going to give you whatever I want. I'm going to give it to you whenever I want to give it to you. This had nothing to do with his job. This had nothing to do with him working the field. This had nothing to do with like socioeconomic status or anything of that nature. But what it was all about was Cain's posture to how he gave back to God an offering of devotion and worship back to God. It wasn't his best. It was like really just the rest, right? I was just going to grab some produce. Hey, here you go, God. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to move on with my day. Cain gave just an offering, not the first fruits, if you will. Can I tell you something? God cannot be second in our lives. God doesn't want to be second in our lives. There's nothing about God here that's like, hey, if you will, if you get time, would, would appreciate just a conversation with you every now and then. God wants and desires and quite frankly deserves to be first in our lives. We see throughout scripture, God is a jealous God, like, and he has the right to be. Like he, he breathed life into us. He breathed life into the world that we live in. And God says, give me your best, not the rest. And Cain just said, yeah, I'll give you whatever, whenever. This offering is the first offering in scriptures. And it's unique that this is also the first offering rejected by God. Like he didn't have regard for it, the Bible says. See, God is setting the standard for the way in which you and I bring worship to him in the very beginning of the scriptures. He does not want our leftovers. He wants, he desires, and he deserves our very best. Like, can you imagine being God here and the way that must have felt for him? And, and like if we're real, like doesn't it kind of feel like Cain just checked the box? I'm just going to give him whatever. I'm just going to check the box here. It felt like some type of religious duty, right? 
guilty of religious duty here, right? There are days when reading the scriptures seems like drudgery more so than just joy. It just feels like religious duty. And I'm often reminded, I'm like, man, how, how would that feel to God when I'm just trying to make it through? Probably like a conversation just trying to make it through with my wife or kids. And I feel like that's what he's talking about here. It's like religious duty. It's like, hey, I'm just going to come. I'm just going to be here. I'm just going to sit. I'm going to listen. I'm going to watch some others sing. I'm going to go and I'm going to leave. And I'm going to be like, man, I checked that box today. Did my worship thing right? Maybe even put it on Instagram, right? To make it look like I had a lot of fun. Um, We're guilty of doing those things. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. It's a start. And I think God would rather us do those things than nothing, but it's not what God really ultimately wants from us. He wants our best. He wants our wholehearted devotion, He wants something that looks like Abel's, right? Where it feels genuine, wholehearted, overflowing with gratitude. Let me give you the firstborn of my flock, the best of what I've had, the first of what I have. And we see in this that God has regard for Abel's offering, the blessing. He blesses that offering because when we give of our best produce, we get the blessing, but we give of our best offering. God gives the blessing. He promises us his presence with us. You see, one of the reasons we talk about first fruits like this is because it shows God the value that he has in our life. Like when we place him first, we're saying, God, you're first in my life. Our kids often, when we have conversation and, and because we have four of them, we can't pick favorites. Henley's for sure the favorite, but we can't tell them that. Don't tell them. I'm just kidding. Um, but we can't have favorites. And we often say, and I'll tell them, I'm like, hey, who's first? And they're like, Jesus. And I'm like, who's second? And they're like, mom. And then they're like, who's third? And they all say Henley. And Henley's like, me. Um, and, and, but they know, but they know without a shadow of a doubt, the first in my life is my relationship with the Lord. And that's what God is asking for us here. The first fruits, when we do that, shows the value that he has in our life. The first of our finances, the first of our time, the first of our talents, the first of our thoughts, the first of our decisions. God doesn't want a check the box follower of Christ. He wants to be first in our life. I said this last week, but this is not like an Old Testament requirement that we're trying to like fulfill here. This is a lifestyle. Like putting God first in your life is a lifestyle that you have to get in the practice of, right? It's the same thing as eating healthy and working out. It becomes a lifestyle and it becomes easier the more you do it. When you include God first, it becomes easier down the road to include him first. When you give God the first fruits, it becomes easier to do that as you give God the first fruits. He wants you to think of him first above everything else. Give your best to him and give the rest to other areas of your life because guess why? When you give God your best, then he blesses the rest. Like that's what he's saying here. When we give God our best, he then wants and desires to bless the rest. He wants wholehearted devotion to him. The best produce gets the blessing. The best offering gets the blessing. And then I think it leads to our third point here, which is the blessing of the best living. The blessing of best living and the blessing of the best living goes beyond our first fruits and our produce and it like embeds itself into our lifestyle in everything that we do in every aspect of our lives. This means that blessing comes when we think of God first in our time, talents, treasures, relationships, decisions, priorities, and all of the things. So often in scripture, we see to love the Lord your God with half your heart, half your soul, half your mind, and half your strength, right? (laughs) Wrong. If you're new to the Bible, it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all of your mind. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24 says this. It says, whatever you do, by the way, say the word whatever. Whatever Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. This passage is written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae, and he is encouraging readers here to approach all of their endeavors with wholehearted devotion and dedication. And when you do this, you enter 
your endeavors as though they're service to the Lord. That means my job is service to the Lord. My relationships are service to the Lord. My decision making is service to the Lord. My time is service to the Lord. What he's saying is that whatever you do, it's service to the Lord. You've heard this 7,000 times, but in the original language, whatever, guess what it means? Whatever. So, hey, Chris, but what about this? Whatever. Well, Chris, what about this area? Whatever. We should be thinking of the Lord first. We should be thinking of the Lord and giving him our best, not what is left over. Paul reminds us, too, that we'll receive a reward of inheritance from the Lord. Like, I don't know, financial inheritance, great gain, but I'm going to tell you what, an inheritance from the Lord is what I'm here for. Like, I want to know that the relationship with him is what I am here for. Paul was talking um, just in, in verse 22. He, he's kind of, in this whole passage in Colossians, it, it's, it's Christ in your home. He's talking about like Christ everywhere. And he's talking about different areas, wives, husbands. He even talks about those that are enslaved. And in that, in verse 22, he says this, don't work only while being watched. Now that's a word and we gotta be careful. When no one is looking, do you still follow Christ with everything you have? When no one's around to see your search history on your websites or on your phone or on your Netflix or on whatever it is, are you still giving God your best in those areas? When no one's around and Sunday morning is over with, Monday through Saturday, are you still giving God everything that you have. When you're at home and alone, or when you're with your friends who are not here with you this morning, are you honoring God with everything that you have? What do the conversations look like? You see, someone that is focused on the, the best living, someone that's focused on the blessed life, like giving their all in Sunday morning worship, it means that Tuesday afternoon with the guys or the girls looks the same. It means that Thursday evening dinner with the kids or with the guys or with the girls or whoever else looks the same. It means that in every facet and avenue of our life, in whatever we do, we're doing it as to service with the Lord. It permeates our entire life because the blessed life is the best life, not just the best two hours on Sunday morning. That's what living the life of a Jesus follower looks like. If someone were watching your every step of the way, where would they see that maybe you needed to give more of your time, talents, treasures, skills, thoughts, decisions to God? More of your first fruits to God. More of your best produce or your best offering and worship to God. And by the way, this doesn't mean that you have to have it all together. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean that, that you have everything right. In fact, Beth Moore, a uh, teacher and author, she said it this way. She said, giving, our, giving God our best is not about perfection. It's about surrendering our hearts and lives to him, trusting that he will use our willingness to bring about his purposes. Like we give him our best so that his purposes can be done in our life. Church, do me a favor. Give God your best, not the rest. Like don't give him your leftovers. Plan your week around him. Start your week with him in mind. Start your decisions with him in mind. Start your meals with him in mind. Start your drive with him in mind. Start your conversations with him in mind. The unique thing about the God that we serve to is that like God doesn't just say all of this and like tell us to hopefully figure it out on his own. Like he's actually a God that didn't do this in theory, but he also did it in practice by sending his son, Jesus. Oswald Chambers has got a fun quote that I've always loved. He says, give God the best that is in you and he will give you the best that is in him, Jesus Christ. Give God the best that is in you, and he will give you the best that is in him. Jesus, by the way, is the firstborn of firstborns. Like, we can look at him in that regard. Can I geek out for just a second? Like, can I just get a little bit? So, like, in the scriptures, in the, in the Old Testament portion of the scriptures, we see this giving of the first fruits, right? We talked about that. The, the firstborn calf would always go, right? It would be sacrificed to the Lord. I know it's weird in today's age, but this is the way it was back then. The firstborn calf would be sacrificed as an offering to the Lord, as a resemblance of giving our best to the Lord. In Exodus 13, the Lord tells Moses, give the firstborn of the animals of the womb, it says. We see this all throughout scriptures. Now, can you just like, can we just be real? I have four kids and I'm sitting there going, 
Like if I was, if I had a bunch of animals and, and we had a calf and it was the firstborn uh, of this mom, I know without a shadow of doubt, my kids would come up and be like, dad, what are you doing? This, this does not seem right. This does not seem like this is something that we should be doing. Like, should we not like raise this thing? Should we not eat this thing? There are so many other things that we could do with this calf. Like what is going on here? Like they would totally ask that. And like, you got to imagine like these parents are doing this in front of these kids. And for generations, this has been going on in these families. These kids are like, what? But God doesn't leave them to wonder why he actually gives the answer. In Exodus 13, verse 14, it says this, in the future, when your son asks, what does this mean? Say to him, by the strength of his hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. You see, what he is saying here is that God wanted them through the offering of the firstborn of these calves to remember his hand and his provision on their life. The fact that they are even there is because God allowed them to be there because he rescued them out of the slavery that they were in. What God is saying all throughout scripture, when he wants us to give his best, he's saying to do this so that they can understand and that others can understand that we only have what we have because of God's hand and God's provision and God's blessing on our life. So when I tell my kids that I give to the Lord first, when I tell my kids that Jesus becomes first, it's because I remind them God sent his son for me because God's first fruit was Jesus Christ. Like that was God's first fruit. He models the example. He sent his only son to die a death that he did not deserve to die because of my sin that put him on that cross. And he says, I'm going to send him so that if you believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, if you ask him to forgive you of your sin, and if you place him as Lord of your life, then you have a right relationship with me forever. You get a chance to live the blessed life the rest of your life. And God says, I did this, and you can be reminded of this. By the way, this gospel came to me on its way to someone else, so I get a chance to look at someone and say, hey, I have what I have because of God. I have what I have because he said that I have peace because of Jesus Christ. I have blessing because of Jesus Christ. I have a peace that surpasses all understanding because God sent his son Jesus for me. Like that's the God that we serve. And so with that in mind, do you think it's hard to give God what is rightfully his? Absolutely not. As our team gets ready to come back up here, I, like what we need to do is to say, okay, God, here's my schedule. Where do you belong? Okay, God, here's the decisions that we are trying to make. Where do you belong? What do you have to say? Okay, God, the, here's, here's my time. Here's my talents. Here's my treasures. How do you want me to use them, Lord? Not, hey, um, we're going to go and do this thing, and it's, it's going to take this much from us, whether that's time, talent, treasures, resources, skills, whatever. We're going to do all this. And hey, God, if you get time on the back end, can you like make some time for me? I'm just imagining having a conversation with my wife and like, hey, I got a really busy week this week. Um, I'm going to be in a ton of meetings. I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. If I get a chance, let's hang out one day. If not, we'll try to make it up some other time. She felt so warm and, and lovey inside if I said that to her. But what I should do is say, hey, what is the moment this week that we can have conversation, that we can date one another? And I want to base the rest of my schedule off of that. Like that's where she's going to feel loved and encouraged and strengthened and known and seen. That's what God is asking us to do in our time and our talents and our treasures and our resources. He's saying, put me first. And then guess what? When we put him first, he wants to bless the rest. May not come out to what we really 
want or desire or what we think in the Americanized version of Christianity that we live in, it's going to look like. But what God is saying is that above all else, I do know this, blessing everything else means that my presence is on what we worked out here. And church, I just need to tell you that there's no greater thing that you can have in your life than God's presence in everything that you do. There's nothing more. All the money in the world won't solve your problems. All the time in the world will not solve your problems. All the resources, all the skills, all the talent, all of those things in the world will not solve your problems. The presence of God can solve your problems. Do you know that you have everything you need right now to do exactly what it is that God has called you to do? You don't need anything else to do exactly what it is that God has called you to do. Sometimes we're just saying, well, I'm gonna work and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna give my best over here because if I just get to this thing over here, if I just get this skill down, if I just get this amount of money in the bank, if I just get these things, then I can do everything God wants me to do. And what you're saying there is that you need Jesus plus something to accomplish what he wants in your life. But God's very clear. We don't need anything else outside of Jesus to do what it is that he's called us to do. You have everything you need right now to do everything that it is that God has called you to do. And he wants your best, not the leftovers, not the second best, not the extra time at the end of the week, the month, the year, or whatever it is. He wants your best, not the rest. So as we go into like a quick time of prayer and the team gets ready to come up and lead us in worship one more time, ask yourself, what area am I not giving God the best in? Like what area, if someone else looked into my calendar, my bank account, my skills, my treasures, whatever it is, what area am I not giving God my best in? Let's pray. Father, forgive us. Forgive me. Too often, we're so concerned about so many other things in the world around us. The chaotic busyness, the hectic schedules, the text messages, the phone calls, the social media, whatever it is, Lord. We're more worried and concerned about those things than we are spending time with you. Our screen time would show us that we're not giving you our best, but we're giving you the rest. Our bank accounts would show that we're not giving you the best, we're giving you the rest. Father, our search history would show that we're not giving you the best, that we're giving you the rest. Our TV shows, our Netflix, recently watched shows, Lord, all of it would show that we're not giving you the best, we're giving you the rest. And Father, you deserve our very best in everything that we do. God, you deserve every ounce of everything that we have, Lord. So help us move in that direction. Help us take steps, Lord, to give you what is all yours anyways. You created and crafted us perfectly in your image, just the way you wanted to create and craft us. Lord, you've given us everything we need right now, today, to do exactly what it is that you desire for us to do. And so God, let us remember that. Let us lean into that. Let us utilize that. Let us hold on to that truth to give you our very best, God, and not the rest. And Father, I pray that when we do that, when we step into that, Lord, that not only would you just fill us with your presence, God, but that you would bless us with your presence continually, reminding us, Lord, that your presence is all we need. Father, I pray for those that have not said yes to following you. Lord, that they would realize that you gave your best in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who died for them in their sin, 
God, and that you sent him so that they could have a right relationship with you forever in heaven. And God, I pray that today would be the day they would say yes to Jesus for the first time. You would use them, you would encourage them, you would strengthen them, you would guide them, you would bless them, Lord. Do what only you can in the way that you can, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And it's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.